My name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Windenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri. Now, this is a show called Insight. We usually discuss books on politics, both domestically and internationally. Sometimes we'll talk about a book on a historical perspective to give some insight into the present. Sometimes we talk about some broader atmospheric books. Uh, this book might in some ways uh, touch on aspects of uh, politics in the sense uh, that uh, when people believe in an ideology, a political ideology too strongly, it tends to prevent the introduction of different ideas into their brain. And so the title of the book is called The Secret Life of the Grown-Up Brain by Barbara Storch. Now, Joining me on the show today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Jesse Bassler. To Jesse's right is Jonah Mead Van Court. And to Jonah's right is Maria Sanchez. So I wanted to read an opening quote and then we'd uh, jump into a discussion uh, about the book. The uh, author writes, for most of human history, middle age has been largely ignored. Middle age has been neglected not only as a distinct reality. <clears throat> For most of human history, of course, such neglect made perfect sense. Lives were brutal and brief. Greek middle age was not even close to our current version. Not that most Greeks made it that far. For one thing, the average life expectancy in ancient Greece was 30 years old. All that changed as the average lifespan in the developed world went from about 47 years to now 78. With this newfound attention, one aspect of middle age has remained neglected, our brains. The prevailing view was that a brain during midlife was, if anything, simply a young brain closing down. Now that view of the brain has changed too. I think the author's correct in saying that the middle age kind of perspective is ignored. A lot of people have an uh, issue defining what middle age is, and I think she, throughout this book, goes on to different ways of looking at it in a psychological stance, looking at the brain chemistry and the makeup of the brain as it ages through middle age, but also the societal standards as we view middle age. A lot of times people kind of fear the idea of becoming middle age because there's, you're not young, you're not old, you're just kind of stuck in this limbo gray area. Yeah, I thought this book was very uh, reassuring for someone who is at past their mid-30s and, appro and approaching the middle age part of life to know that there's more to look forward to. There's more that your brain has in store and you're not just going to go downhill. You might actually go uphill in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, as mentioned, the context of middle age has overall just been like not just overshadowed, but to a certain extent discredited as we go into middle age. Meaning that as teens in high schools, uh, where a good portion of our parents are in middle age, there's this notion, arguably in an American cultural sense, that our parents just don't understand, don't know what we're going through, we don't understand our decisions and such, and then we continue to grow, and more importantly, we continue, we regret, and we find ourselves in these situations where we reminisce on, like, if we just listened to our parents, we could have avoided or just steered. Um, but of course, our parents are, are not always right. It's just to, uh, that our brains are, have the potential to solve such diverse problems that we as teens may not see or even themselves. Uh, yeah, middle age, she's having trouble defining it in the book. She more or less, I think, eventually feels somewhere between 40 and about 68, mm -hmm. um, which is what she's defining. She had a good quote, said, it's more than just about memory and names. Our brains at midlife have other issues as well. Sometimes when I'm driving now, I look up and realize that I've not been paying the slightest attention to the road, but instead I've been thinking of something else entirely. I spend five frustrating minutes looking for my toothbrush to put in my suitcase, only to find that I had just minutes before 
already put my toothbrush in the suitcase. After I packed it, I've gotten distracted looking for a sweater and wish all thoughts of toothbrush were out the window again. Yeah, like she said, it's difficult to pinpoint where that age is going to come about, and the 40 to 68 is dependent on what we consider a full life. So most people consider a full life now around 90, 100, so you would look at the middle of that to find the middle age. And so that can kind of affect the way she's perceiving how middle-aged people view themselves, like forgetting that your toothbrush is there, or going on auto plane mode when you're you're driving home but I do that and I'm 22 I yeah. think it's it's an interesting perspective of calling that a middle-aged issue I think just as our brains are developing in different ways and she goes on later in the book to explain that because our brains are so focused on opposite things that we usually were focused on like as younger people were focused on just life experiences and our body in the space that we are in versus middle-aged people or quote-unquote middle-aged people are focusing on bigger grander things so they forget those little things but again it's it's not like a middle-aged issue it's wherever these people fall in the line of what society is deeming middle age at that time yeah this uh, book t going off that talks about how when you get older your brain does begin to deteriorate in a certain way but what you do to compensate is you do something called bilateralization where you use both hemispheres of your brain in order to accomplish a task that when you're younger you only had to use one hemisphere for mm. And because of that, you're going to actually have a, a net increase in your ability to do core skills, like your job, but you're going to lose your, like your cognitive ref reflexes skills. You're, you're going to become a little bit more scattered brain when it comes to day-to-day -day chores. But in the whole, what you value most, you might, you'll actually see a systemic improvement in your ability to accomplish those tasks. Mm. Yeah, the author makes a very crucial distinction that forgetfulness, forgetfulness during middle age, uh, people tend to experience as she accounts for distractions and then thoughts that just bounce out of her head is part of normal aging. It's not tied automatically with dementia as more people start to believe, but rather more so a common indication of aging. As the author states, memory is composed of many factors that are not equally distributed as um, some parts continue to be strong. And as she mentioned, some areas of our brain actually are, in, are open to improvements and rather just to grow and regrowth. Yeah, as a quote I like she wrote, uh, there is a new image of the middle age brain that has emerged, and that is this. Our middle age brains are surprisingly competent and surprisingly talented. We're smarter, calmer, happier, and as one scientist put it, we know stuff. Exactly. So the idea behind middle age is everyone's like, oh, I'm losing my marbles, I'm forgetting where things are, I'm so distracted. You think of it as a deterioration, but in fact, you're actually growing, like you said, in different parts of your brain. So because you're already solidifying those connections that you have to make in adolescence, like pairing things together, the general life, like rules, then you kind of can focus on grander schemes. You're happier, you're calmer, you're more knowledgeable. You've gained this wisdom throughout your life and you're actually improving your brain that way because you have so much information in your brain. You kind of look at the negatives. You're like, oh, I'm forgetting this, I'm doing that, I must be going bonkers. Instead of looking at the positives, there's a lot of positives to a middle-aged brain as it develops. And so if we could approach that from a positive standpoint and look at the good things that are happening to our brain, it might kind of change people's perspective of a middle-aged brain. Yeah, you uh, yeah. I mean, you also mentioned we get happier. That was one thing that they mentioned a lot throughout the book, which I kind of always thought that when you get older, you have your middle life crisis, you lose your identity, you have to get it back. But it says in this one, you, you uh, as you get older, you, you get happier, and that has a lot to do with um, being able to see bigger picture. Like if I see a photo right now of someone getting beaten, I'm going to be just angry or sad. If someone older sees that, they're gonna feel they're gonna feel sad. They're gonna feel angry. They're gonna look at the they're gonna look at society, what brought them to there. They're gonna look at all the stuff, and they're gonna have a more broader and also happier uh, conclusion than I would get to myself. Well, the happier isn't because somebody got beat up, because <laughs> yeah. it might be a solution exactly. to yeah. try to prevent it. Yeah, and that term, the midwife crisis, she uh, disputes that and says mm -hmm. there really isn't something called the midwife crisis. It's sort of the myth of the midwife crisis, just as uh, you end up having the notion of thinking the empty nest, the same thing, that when the kids leave home that you're all sad because they left home. And she's saying, well, that may not be true also. Exactly. It's all about reconsidering a whole new image of middle-aged people because we as a society tend to associate good health at our younger 20s, uh, like 
uh, being at our best at sports or our best sex appeal at 20s or being our best uh, academically achieving in college areas, which is mostly in our 20s. So she does a great job of, of rebranding uh, to say middle age because our brains are regrowing again just the way uh, we train our, our babies and children to go into the next phase. Middle age should be treated that way to retrain and regrow and as you said broaden our perspective on certain things. Yeah, and addressing those myths. Anna, she doesn't bring it up in the book but I thought it was interesting because she's saying you have to understand middle age or what she called planet middle age because of its link to planet old age so that <laughs> how you deal with planet middle age sets the tone for how you're going to then uh, do well there yeah. mentally. Exactly. So she's looking at the brain as like use it or lose it. So if we can develop our brains in adolescence and continue to develop them in middle age and solidify those connections, we're going to have a greater chance in older age to avoid Alzheimer's disease and things like that. Um, but she also looks at like the statistical data like you brought up is that we have this preconceived notion that the middle age is something to dread, that it's the next step before you get to planet old age. And everyone fears that because they want the vibrant youth that we had in our 20s. But in fact, she finds that it, it's not a statistically evident sad period of our life. There is no midlife crisis statistic. It just is an anomaly we based in society. Yeah, one thing that they talked about earlier, and you mentioned this when you say we just know stuff now. And the, the explanation that she says about why we know stuff is because we actually get more white matter in our brains, which is, it's fat. It's fat insulating our neurons. And, a lot, and which does it seem sort of counterintuitive because we sort of uh, associate being fat with being slower and being uh, just, just not as sharp as someone who's going to the gym, right? but, but fat in your brain actually will help you as almost as insulation and it will help you be able to call on information without even trying to and being able to put forward and that's why people in their, in the, their 50s can run massive companies in, in a way that uh, someone in their 20s couldn't even begin to imagine how to deal with that kind of stress or uh, that m amount of information. It's more of a as a trade-off in a sense that we're trading our speed, which is slowed down by the fat you mentioned in our brains, and to more of accuracy and quality. As she mentions a, a chess uh, ex example or the picture, uh, you would want the more experienced chess, even though someone younger might be quicker in responding. The chess, uh, an older chess player, has a more accurate or more uh, depiction of how the game goes in an overall uh, sense. Or the pitcher who's maybe losing speed as he gets older but we'll have more uh, tactics in, in providing accuracy pitches. The uh, chess issue you brought up, they also referred to that in terms of air traffic controllers having to retire at age 55, feeling that they then have some mental deterioration. Mm -hmm. But that's only in the United States, so they looked at studies of air traffic controllers in Canada where you can stay longer beyond 55 and found no difference and uh, I think they looked at airline accidents and that you're looking at if uh, you're holding, having older airline tra traffic controllers, there was no change so that there was a lot of myth associated with sort of a deteriorating brain for air traffic controllers. That's based on our societal standard. They think, oh, as they get older, you're slowing down. You're not able to make those rapid decisions. But in this correlation study, they found that there was no difference in younger people who were looking at air traffic control versus older people. There's very slight differences, and most of them were just processing speed. The younger people were coming to the conclusion slightly faster, but overall, the older middle age group was still making the right decisions and kind of guiding it. And so, like in Canada, for example, they allow them up to 65. They find no difference in our air issues than um, they do in theirs. So it, it's kind of a preconceived notion that you're thinking they're slowing down, but in fact, we're kind of wasting those years that we could be using those experienced air traffic controllers because once you have that experience, like you said, with the chess player, you find these kind of ideas that you can move through a problem solving quickly and efficiently without having that necessary like breakneck speed that you would have in your younger years. And if you think about even within our culture, there are hints that make that make more sense sense like if you were playing a game like bridge or chess and you were playing on a team would you want to have a young witty smart person on your team or an old wise guru on your team we i think most people would think about it and conclude that you want the old wise person because we do on some level associate age with wisdom he uh, brings that up also in terms of pitchers at age so that their fastball slows down but then they learn how to adapt by developing other pitches mm -hmm. And so once again, you're learning how to adapt. It was a nice quote she had. She said, uh, there's a major line of thinking about the brain 
that as you age, uh, the problem is that you'll have more distractions, so it's a reason why you get more distracted. And so that she spent some time addressing that because you sort of feel like you're getting forgetful, but then you're realizing, well, yeah, when you were younger, you didn't have all these things to think about and constantly remember, and so it's sure it's easier. It goes through the aging of adolescence. When we're young, especially when we look at even toddlers, how we're developing our sight and our senses and our tactile responses, it, it, there's not a lot to think about, and therefore we're kind of fast. We're just focused on the minimal things. And as you kind of age through life and gain more wisdom and gain more responsibility, these middle-aged people have to focus on, like you said, running a giant company, but also doing the daily life tasks that adolescents people just don't have to deal with. They have to focus on the very, very small amount of issues and responsibilities. And so as you get to middle age and you're having these vast responsibilities and these vast needs for your brain, you think you're forgetting, but you're just focusing on the little stuff and your brain's kind of mulling over, well, this is kind of novel stuff. We've never really needed to focus on this. It's little things. And therefore, you can kind of make the mistake of like, oh, I'm, I'm getting slower. I'm losing my mind. But really, your brain is focused on bigger and larger and more important issues. She talks about uh, something called the Seattle Longitudinal Study that was begun in 1956. So then every few years they look at the same 6,000 people in this study uh, and they're doing this for a health maintenance organization in Seattle to see how they change in their thinking. So that from the results of this study they're showing that uh, people's cognitive skills get better as they uh, age and they're not looking at deterioration, that they're looking at just sort of changes in how you approach the process of thinking. Yeah, well, that was, I remember that study. One interesting thing about it was the people that reported to uh, take in more antioxidants like wine and the people that exercised more uh, had superior uh, cognitive function and overall health at that age. I mean, I'm sure you can correlate the health to mm. the athleticism, but. I, it was interesting because it isn't just genetic; it's how you use it. If you can, yeah. if it's a muscle, your brain is a muscle. We say we hear that a lot, but it's so true. It's if you use it, you, you, there's so many amazing benefits you can get. Like that reminds me of the the story about the chess player who could realize he went from four moves to three moves. He could only think he used to be able to think seven moves ahead. Now he can only think three. He ended up dying so eight years later. They realized he had advanced stage Alzheimer's, but he was so smart and his brain was so strong that it was able to protect him from the symptoms of a horrible disease. Yeah. From, uh, from the Seattle study, it just re-examines this conventional wisdom of middle age that we're not capable of understanding complex and diverse solutions when in fact the study shows that we might be at our best potential at our at cognitive, cognitive strategies, more so an arguably an important one, the inductive reasoning, applying experiences and uh, knowledge in a broader perspective than just focusing narrowly on one solution when we can manage to focus overall. And it's not just applied in a modern world in traditional societies. Uh, older people in those uh, societies, unofficial or official political heads, they're, they're the ones tend, uh, people look at because they acknowledge that sometimes younger people don't have the experiences that the older people have received overall in managing their society. And it's from this study that they began to look at the notion there was a decline in pessimism among people <laughs> in middle age and more of a positive outlook about how you see things. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, she kind of explains that with age comes wisdom. She doesn't necessarily mean that like you have to be older to have wisdom, but I think that wisdom comes along with more optimism. You've seen a lot of things, you've seen negativity, you've seen how things kind of play out in our society, especially in the political realm as we've discussed. And I think once you get to that stage, you're like, okay, this is going to be fine. We've had this before. It'll get over it. We've done this with world wars and things. And I think at a younger generation, especially our generation, we haven't faced a lot in that kind of aspect. We haven't seen how things um, end or have an outcome. So for us, we're very pessimistic. We're like, oh, this is the end of the world. This is so bad because we've never lived through it. We don't have that experience to kind of rely on as middle-aged people do. Yeah, and she mentions that, and she also goes on to say, we're living longer. We're continuing to live longer every every year, and all this extra time is at the end. And a lot of people they don't aren't they aren't not content to lie on a beach for twenty years and and, and just in deteriorate away. They, they, well, they still have so much to give. And she makes the point that we need to actually try to reshape our society in order to give people that have high cognitive function into, into even into their eighties a, a place in society. And I I, I mean I, I think that she also makes the point that we should work less a week, 
but work more, a, for a longer span of time, which would be a slower pace of life, but we would be able to space out our uh, intellect over a longer period of time. And when going with uh, living longer and being more positive, what she mentioned about is as we be able to live longer, we are able to recognize what is harmful to us and what we've done, what was harmful as, a, as, as youth. And that's not just because we, as middle-aged brains, we just blindly out ignore the negative. It's just that we know what's better for us and we tend to focus on what is uh, better for us in our health. And as some studies show, stress factors and that we put ourselves through hell as young is harming us now and realizing through our middle age brains that we shouldn't do that. It's better for us to stay more positive than focus on the negative. She called it the positivity effect and then the way she explains it is the best brains, brightest brains are the ones that have the biggest bias toward being positive. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how she uh, discusses this and so you know again you're looking at trying to set the stage, so to speak, for then what comes next, older age, but she doesn't really dwell on that on the book. It's sort of to just say it's going to set the stage that if you're going to do well later in life, older, then you're going to mm -hmm. do so because of what you're doing in middle age. Exactly. Positive brains are actually physically healthier. She does kind of go into that. And going back to what you said, Jonah, is the, the white matter in your brain, the healthier your brain is, the better you're going to do in later in life. That's just a fact. So the healthier you have a brain, more antioxidants, the stronger your brain is. If you're using your memory and correlation, your brain's going to last longer. It's less likely to have diseases like Alzheimer's. And she kind of pins that onto positivity because a negative brain, a negative outlook can actually physically affect your brain. It can affect your organs, affect your heart. So we see people who are under high stress situations wrinkle really quickly, they get gray hairs because you are putting stress on your body, your body's going to have a response. And so for her, as she says, middle-aged people are more positive, and if we can keep that positivity into older age, you're going to have a healthier brain, a healthier body, and therefore live longer, be healthier, and have a better brain. Which just goes to um, disprove that uh, myth of middle uh, life crisis where, you know, kids go off to college, uh, parents are uh, stress-free more to, uh, mm -hmm. to say. They don't have to worry about their uh, feeding or providing uh, the needs they, the kids had when they were in their household. And that just uh, almost provides that happiness that she mentions and that peacefulness that she continues to mention as we go into middle age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her quote, our middle age brains work incredibly hard to be enthusiastic about life to see the good things, a trait that may be one of the biggest advantages a brain can have. Because then she's saying that negatives are so overwhelming, you have to work to overcome the negative to see the positive. So uh, that's uh, you know, really a point she constantly stresses through the book. Exactly. You want that healthy, positive brain to overcome all the negativity. Negativity is just going to wreak havoc on your brain. So that's something a benefit of a middle age is, is. You're going to be more positive. You're going to have a healthier brain versus an adolescence or aging brain. And they, and they really did specify that there are very tangible effects of being a happier, healthier, having a happier, healthier brain. Like th There are um, diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, mm. that you will, if, if you work on your brain, if you play bridge, if you, if you just continue to work into late life, you will not, even if you get those diseases, you won't even experience, experience the, the symptoms of them until at the very end of the disease. Mm. So like, it, it, if, you, if you have a very poor brain, you don't work it out, you might experience Alzheimer's and have a slow decline over 10 years. Or if you're incredibly uh, like, uh, versatile and uh, have a lot of stamina in your brain, you might live nine and a half years without any noticeable symptoms and then just die in six months. There's a quote she has. There, there's an argument to be made that the true test of a human brain is the ability to figure out other human brains. So then she calls this social expertise, how you can evaluate characters of other people and that you're going to do so differently when you're younger than when you're older. Yeah, she actually explains that middle-aged people are much better at reading social cues, at social judgments, at kind of having empathy and our guidance is basically improved by age. It's due to our, our brain kind of developing these social skills over time as well as maturity developing with middle age. And so she finds that more brain cells are actually devoted to navigating these kind of social structures and dealing with other humans and understanding them versus when we were younger and our body functions were our main focus as young adolescents, developing our motor skills, developing kind of how we react to ourselves 
once you get to that middle age part, you've kind of already adapted that and you can move on to understand the humans and the space around you. Yeah, when she uh, went through parts of the book to define wisdom, and I, I think that was why I was, as I go, went through the books, and this is a course usually that we talk about uh, political books, and her concept of wisdom is as uh, sort of the idea to become aware of the gray as opposed to the black and white. And so when people sort of fall into that category of I'm an absolute conservative, I'm an absolute liberal, you're mm -hmm. on a TV show where they're make-believe liberal and make-believe conservative arguing with each other and nobody's in that nuanced gray area that how TV is perhaps uh, helping you to not develop wisdom. And she, she's saying, that you know you have to have that gray area development and then you want to be reflective to look at something in a broader picture and have empathy for other people and that uh, liberalism versus conservatism silliness doesn't allow you to develop that yeah. empathy going off that you the, the point they made was that TV is a good way to not think. It's a good way to have your opinions and your thoughts fed to you. You don't have to do the thinking yourself. And if you don't think, you don't use your brain, you lose it. As you said, you use it or lose it. So the reason, so yeah, I, I totally agree that, that, that uh, the, like, the kind of uh, editorializing that just feeds you like uh, emotions is going to be a great way for you not to develop your hippo gyrus and not to develop white matter. And, and to end up just having, being stuck in your ways until the end. Mm. Yeah, which is why I think um, a lot of young people in, in our generation have a hard time uh, being either in the middle because we don't have that experience, as she mentions, that we develop over time and time just um, adding perspectives to our judgment and creating these new, uh, broader perspectives as per se, uh, someone who's older who's, sometimes we don't understand their decisions, we're like, why are they doing this? It doesn't make sense to us. But because they've experienced things that make them provide a broader general sense to our view. We only have a few minutes left. What'd you think of this book? Would you recommend the viewers uh, read it? I think it's going to be a very good book, not only for people who are in that middle age factor, but also for younger people to kind of see what they're going through. It kind of explains a lot of different studies and series that go into the different physical effects of the brains, the social effects, and it kind of examines the sociological impacts of middle age. Hmm. I thought I would recommend the book, first of all. I think it was a, had a lot of information. I thought it was a very optimistic book to read, especially someone in their middle age. Um, my, only concern, my only complaint was that there was way, too, in my opinion, there was way too many personal examples mm -hmm. that it took about, there's probably about, uh, 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 probably about 8% of the book, eight, uh, eighth of the book is about personal examples. I would recommend this orientated to a younger audience such as college students mm -hmm. and uh, high school students just because that will be the beginning to re-examine and rebrand the middle age as something that we should be uh, happy to look forward and just uh, so, uh, associating a different meaning with the quality of middle age brains. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I like the idea of all the personal stories. It gave it sort of a reflective way of understanding uh, something. I guess it depends on how old you are when you're reading the book. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I, I liked the book, and I thought it was a very hopeful book. And yeah, I'd recommend people to read it. It doesn't take long to go through it, even though she does address sort of scientific and neurological studies. She handles them well, and it's fairly easy to get through them. So. Thank you for joining us today.